A six-hour-old baby is being taken away by social workers from his mother. It is a forced adoption, and this is footage the social workers never wanted you to see. Britain is the only country in Europe which commonly allows adoption without parental consent. Adoption is for good, and as soon as we can place a child in a loving home permanently, better for all concerned. The government's new Children and Families Act is likely to increase the number of cases. Those who've been social workers for a long time went into social work primarily to support families. The reality now is that they are almost exclusively involved in child protection. Uh, and that is uh, a major policy change. An increasing number of mothers are so frightened they are fleeing abroad, helped by an unofficial network of supporters. Over in France here, they do not believe me when I tell them that they can take children for emotional abuse, let alone risk of it. It is now harder than ever for families which need help to stop their children being forcibly adopted. It's, it's a very, very worrying picture because it means that we're just going to continue on this trend um, towards permanent removal of children. This is a film about the heartbreak of losing a child and the added pain of the secrecy that surrounds it. I really miss him. I really do. I really, really miss him. Last year, 1,860 children in Britain were adopted without parental consent. It's called forced adoption. The decisions are final. The parents cannot see their child until 18 years of age, and then only if the child wishes. This father had already lost his older children to adoption because he and his wife couldn't cope without support. The decision to take this child was made by the courts before he was even born. Um, it was a home birth, pretty easy. I held my son. One of the midwives went outside and got on the phone to social services to tell them that there's now a, a baby boy. Within just a few hours of the birth, social workers arrived. Outside the door, there was, um, I think there was five or six child protection policemen and women trying to convince us to hand over our newborn son. I came in, I put the webcam on to record then. He secretly filmed social services actions from this point. I was hoping it would go viral and people would show it all over the internet, hoping that someone will listen. They start drilling the locks out, and the whole flat seemed to vibrate. My son starts crying because there's really loud vibration sound. And then the policeman comes in. If you're proud of yourself, what's the danger? What is the danger? There was no suggestion the baby was in imminent danger, but social services obtained a court order to remove him because they said he could be at risk of future harm. Where is the danger? They're just saying they've got an order, they've got to follow it. They have to follow their orders. So you feel you got, there's nothing you can do to stop it. You feel powerless, useless, you know, worthless. So, can you pass, can you pass him to me, please? To me, what? No, I'm trying to help, I'm trying to help my wife to protect my son from you lot. You're going to get arrested, aren't you? I don't care, do you think I care? Right. I think I'm bothered if you arrest me. And then they started pulling my wife's arms. No! Okay, well, I don't mean to scare you. Yes, I, definitely, do. uh, I definitely don't want to scare you. So please pass it. You're causing trauma once it's mum. Let's make a baby once as soon as it comes out. Once it's mum. It. 
as soon as I got the baby out of the flat. Would you calm down if someone stole your child? Goodbye. Leave you to it. All I could do was hold my wife, you know. Within an hour of social workers leaving, he posted the webcam footage of his son's removal online. In doing so, he risked imprisonment as the details of child proceedings must be kept secret in order to protect the identity of the child. Parents are not allowed to tell anyone what's happening to them and the media is forbidden from reporting any details. Martha Kova has specialised in child law for 25 years and believes there have been incidences where the law on secrecy has been taken too far. The purpose of the legislation that protects the confidentiality of children's proceedings and the identity of children and their families is to protect them. But by a sidewind, it's had the effect of also protecting poor local authority practice, poor social work and inadequate experts and poor expert reporting to the courts. Local authorities are required to ensure a child's identity is protected in family court proceedings. In this father's case, within days of posting his video, Staffordshire County Council started High Court proceedings against him. Staffordshire County Council, they, their response was to get it pulled off the internet as quick as possible. It just feels like an injustice. They just reach into your life and take it all away. And then they're telling me to be quiet about it. This secret filming proved to be a game changer. In an extraordinary ruling last summer, the president of the family division, Sir James Munby, refused the injunction to silence the father. He said the veil of secrecy had gone too far. Martha Kova believes the ruling means that the local authorities can no longer assume their actions are protected from public scrutiny. This is the judgment of the president of the family division, Sir James Munby, which refused the injunction sought by Staffordshire Council. And in fact, he was completely satisfied that allowing the father to do this would not uh, risk identifying the child. So what he said was, I simply fail to see how naming the local authority, the social workers, the local authority's legal representatives, or the children's guardian, or even all of them, can in any realistic way be said to make it likely that Jay, who is the baby, will be identified even indirectly. The risk is merely fanciful. The parents have now had final contact with their baby. This landmark ruling has given them a voice. We asked Staffordshire Council why they wanted to stop the father's webcam filming being seen and whether the method of the son's removal was necessary. They did not respond specifically to these points. But they did say that placing a child into care is an absolute last resort, and it was the courts and not the council which make the final decision based on significant concern for the welfare of the child. We are moving rather rapidly, in my opinion, away from doing everything that is feasible and reasonably to be expected to keep children within their family of origin and moving to adoption very rapidly. And it's, it's borne out by the statistics which are produced by the Department of Education. There's been a 95% increase in, in the number of court orders which are required in order to allow a local authority to place a child for adoption in the last three years. Once a child has been approved for a potential adoption, it is incredibly tough for birth parents to ever get their children back. This woman got her children back from care this year. It took her 12 months of fighting. Under the new legislation, she would not have this time. Her children are still under a 12-month supervision order. She remains in fear of social services and is asked to remain anonymous. I'm frightened in case I'm judged on the way they look. If there's a mark, if there's a mark for, for, um, when one of them got scratched, um, I was worried in case they thought 
that I had done the scratch. So I'm, I'm like, oh, the, I even recorded it down. I write everything down. Any accidents that happen, I write it all down. I take pictures because they're so quick to use anything against me. So quick. Soon after giving birth, she struggled to cope with four young children under four and suffered from postnatal depression. I phoned social services and asked them, you know, can you come and help me, please? And they said, no, no, we don't get involved unless something drastic happens. And I took an overdose, a big one, to the, to the point I was given three hours to live. And, um, and then social workers got involved after that and never let go. In her first hearing, the judge rejected an application on the grounds of neglect. But the local authority then made another case against her, this time based on future risk of harm. They looked at everything like um, my relationship with, um, with my husband, the relationship as a mother with my children, my way, my, um, my home, the way I fed them, had what I offered them to eat, um, my routines, my boundaries, everything got scrutinized and pulled apart to the, to the way that they said was not good enough. And they didn't come in to offer support. At that point, you think, she took an overdose, this parent needs help, she needs support, and obviously there's problems, but they didn't. Social services were actively seeking for prospective adopters for her children while she was still trying to prove she was a good mother. Well, I'd done loads of different courses, I'd done a parenting course, which even after, like, there was n not one mention of any parenting, but I still done it anyway. Uh, I'd done a marriage course, even though there was no problems with my marriage. I'd done so many courses because I wanted to cover every avenue where they could throw back at me. I wanted to prove that I didn't have problems in any of these. I was fighting back. Her children remained with foster carers for over seven months as her struggle continued. When I didn't see them, I thought, I'm giving up. I can't do any more. They put that much pressure on us. I thought, I can't go on. I can't keep fighting like this. When I see them, I thought, how can I give up on them? How can I walk away from them? Because if I walk, if I give up, it's walking away, it's walking away from them. And they need me. They need me more than anything in this whole world. And I've come so far. Having finally satisfied both the courts and social services that she was a good mother, her children were returned. However, she remains on a supervision order and the local authority could apply for another care order at any time if they believe they have the grounds to do so. So for 12 months, oh, I don't know, I just want to keep myself, like, perfect. Oh, I should say the, the perfect parent and mother and person for social services, in their eyes. Not anyone else's, but their eyes. Year-long battles like this to get children back are less likely to happen in the future with the new Children and Family Act now in force. The act, which came into play in April this year, sets a target of just 26 weeks from when a child is taken from parents and a care plan is approved. Experts fear that as adoption is often part of this plan, the time pressure on parents to prove themselves capable is likely to be increased. What if at the very beginning of proceedings, you have a mother who gave up drugs when she was pregnant? Who gave up drugs when she was pregnant? She's now had the baby. But every expert in the field will tell you a minimum of 12 months of abstinence is what you've got to look for. We don't have time. We've got to make our decision within 26 weeks. That's the real evil of 26 weeks. And the result is that many lawyers and many judges are concerned that it's resulting in children being placed for adoption who shouldn't be placed for adoption. My life was transformed by being adopted. Um, I was, um, when I was just four months old, uh, taken into the home of um, uh, two people who didn't know me. They were taking a gamble on me um, and they took me uh, into their home and into their hearts, and as a result of that, I've enjoyed amazing opportunities. The Act is a passion project of Education Secretary Michael Gove, a strong advocate for adoption having been adopted himself. The new Act has heightened concerns about the way the system is changing amongst many professionals. 
Bridget Robb heads the largest body of social workers in Britain. I am delighted that, that some of the politicians have had a good experience of adoption. That's exactly what we want for all children who are with adoptive families and what those families want. But to extend that to say, therefore, adoption is good for everybody is, is of itself naive and, and a political ideology. The harrowing case of Baby P sent shockwaves of anger and revulsion around the country. High-profile tragedies in which social workers were accused of neglect are being used by the government to strengthen the case for the faster removal of children. In all too many cases, when we decide to leave children in need with their biological parents, we are leaving them to endure a life of soiled nappies and scummy baths, chaos and hunger, hopelessness and despair. These children need to be rescued. The rhetoric of this government is, is much harsher than previous governments in terms of supporting adoption in contrast to the support given to birth families. And that is new, it is harsher, it fits very much with the language about welfare um, and the language about, uh, almost to call it an underclass of people who are not uh, not fit to look after their children. Emma Campbell, an independent social worker, believes since Baby P's death in 2007, many social workers are actually overcautious to the detriment of families. Any, any high-profile scandal such as the Baby P is going to be terrifying for any social worker. The sensationalisation and the demonisation of any social worker in the press will make a social worker think, what if this is me? Um, and, and so going into a family where even the slightest doubt might be there for a social worker, then it would be easier for them to act on the side of caution and remove a child than perhaps think, let's see if we can keep a child within this family. Judges rarely grant interviews, but the Honourable Sir Mark Headley, a retired High Court judge, has been given special permission to speak out. There is a highly defensive atmosphere around, both in social services and in the state generally, um, about future disasters like that happening again. That has meant, I think, that uh, there is increased regulation, there is an increased pressure on social workers to intervene where they might not have done so in the past. Thank you very much. If you could kind of bunch in together, then we'll do a quick, quick shot. The new Conservative candidate for Telford, Lucy Allen, has her sights set on Parliament. But two years ago, concerns were raised about her ability to parent by Wandsworth Social Services. Oh, good morning. good morning. Hello, I'm Lucy Allen. I'm the Conservative. If it hadn't happened to me, I would not have believed it because I had absolute confidence in the way our state operates wouldn't have occurred to me at that time uh, that it could happen until it did happen to us. Really good to meet you. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. Cheerio. I worked Bye -bye. on the Wandsworth fostering and adoption panels where we would assess cases right. of the most vulnerable children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And in about six years of sitting on those panels, I don't recall any more than one occasion where the panel disagreed with the recommendations of the social workers because the case had been made. Um, and then they can have one of those as well. Uh, when I came to read a file about me and my family, um, some of the things that I was reading about us was more extreme than some of the files that had come to fostering panel. Um, and it suddenly occurred to me that some of these cases might not have been any different to me. She made a very nice lunch afterwards. Yeah. But I suppose we'll get to the pub well, this time. Loved it because it was all Life appeared to be going well for Lucy, but in 2011 she started suffering from depression. Worried about the effect on her son, she decided to visit her GP surgery to seek help. Well, I told her that I was feeling very down, I was very tearful, um, and I was worried about my son. And I think that that was, for her, an immediate trigger of concern. So tomorrow, what are we going to do tomorrow, Chris? But within, it would have been within about five minutes of meeting me, uh, she announced that she felt that our family needed social service intervention. And for me, that was a huge, 
huge shock and I couldn't quite understand. I kept thinking, oh, why, 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 why? The GP followed guidelines and four days later, a social worker arranged to meet Lucy at home. The system had kicked in and she was now being assessed as a fit mother. She started saying things like, very leading questions, this is the most depressed you've ever been in your life, isn't it? And I said, well, no, not really. And you've got clinical depression, haven't you? And I said, well, I don't think the, the doctors suggested that to me. And then towards the end of the, end of the interview, she said, ah, oh, and now I need to talk to the police. And immediately, I thought, OK, something's... This is... This is serious. From her own professional experiences, Lucy knew that she had to act fast. She got an independent mental health assessment and she gave this to Wandsworth Social Services. A consultant psychiatrist had said this person uh, is no risk to herself, no risk to her son, no risk to any third party. Uh, she's got a moderate depression which could be treated with counselling um, and antidepressants. Um, and at that point I thought that was closed, the matter was closed. And that was all within the space of about a week. You know, that was end of, uh, as far as I was concerned. Lucy then obtained a copy of an open letter sent by Wandsworth Social Services, notifying her son's school and the police of their investigations. A letter setting out these concerns of a serious mental health impairment that would have a significant impact on parenting, um, written to whomever it may concern, not marked private or confidential. I remember thinking, oh my God, I know what happens next. Uh, because you don't leave a child in a family in those circumstances. In any, you just do not. It is normal procedure for social services to flag up an investigation to relevant authorities such as the school and police. But what Lucy didn't realize at the time was that social services had made an official record of their suspicions. They had ticked a box on their file saying that this child was at risk of significant harm from his mother. And that is a permanent record and has to be disclosed uh, should I seek a, uh, a CRB check for any work uh, with children in the future. Lucy felt she had to start legal action in order to establish her child had never been at risk of significant harm. It was a big legal battle. Uh, we had solicitors, we had top QC, and that's the sort of resource that's not available to everybody. Lucy discovered that social services made an official record of their original concerns without conducting the usual preliminary investigations. It took two and a half years for Lucy to receive the confirmation she needed to wipe the slate clean. But we have now received this letter saying categorically that uh, they did in fact find that my son was happy and well and not at risk of harm. Wandsworth Council failed to explain why they had not followed usual procedure, but they did say, the council has a legal duty to investigate all child protection and safeguarding concerns properly regardless of the family's background. It concluded that as a consequence of inquiries conducted over a period of 12 days, her son was not at risk and that no further action was required. There is generally a concern that in the wake of Baby P, loving families all over the UK are suffering as we strive to protect our children at any cost. It is a climate of fear. Uh, a climate where uh, people cover their backs, a climate where people want to uh, try and do their best by families, but also know that they've got to do, play this game safe, safe for them as an organisation, safe for them as a worker, not just safe for the child. The French Riviera, an unlikely place to find supporters of British families fighting adoptions. But a British multimillionaire based in the south of France has made it his mission to try to stop forced adoptions in the UK. And have they threatened to eventually take the baby from you or not? 
Ian Joseph says he receives a thousand calls a year from parents seeking legal advice and will even pay for them to flee Britain. Yes, I have the uh, usual number of uh, emails today. I always get uh, about two or three completely new cases every day and uh, three or four or five follow-up ones. Uh, just as a sample, you've got here a young girl, she's 19, she's pregnant. What's she worried about? Because the social services say they're going to take her baby at birth. And they've told her so. Why? Because there's a risk of emotional abuse. Over in France here, they do not believe me when I tell them that they can take children for emotional abuse, let alone risk of it. Mary, not her real name, is in France on the run from British social services. After concerns about her mental health, they decided to take her older children away. So when she became pregnant with this child, she was desperate to keep him. On the advice of Ian Joseph, she fled to France. She has agreed to speak to us anonymously from a secret location. He gave me a lot of advice on what to do, where to go. I just, took, I just kind of hoped for the best, really. I didn't really know if I could trust him or not. He said that it would be better to leave the UK before the baby is born. And he also advised me to contact local social workers in the area of where, where I went to. I didn't want to leave because obviously I still have two children in England. I had no other choice. If I stayed, they would have t taken my new baby and I just couldn't let that happen. In Britain, once a child is removed, that parent can expect social services to be automatically involved in the fate of any future children. When somebody becomes pregnant who has already had a child removed, there will be a much quicker assumption that that child, when it is born, should also be removed. Political pressures and the financial pressures on the services at the moment are not to take the risk and uh, to, to bring that child into care and to move them on to adoption as soon as possible. I get so many people, but the ones that get me rattled the most, I suppose, are the pregnant ladies, because what chance have they got and what chance have the children got? I tell them the best thing they can do uh, if they're pregnant is to leave, because no one can stop a pregnant woman leaving the country. They can't put an order on a fetus. They tried, and the judges ruled no, that they couldn't do that. Does it ever bother you that you're not qualified to give legal advice? Well, I think I am, honestly, because uh, I've got a law degree from Oxford, but that's 50 years old, so the law has changed a little bit <laughs> since then. But uh, what I have got is, I think, more experience than any lawyer in the family courts, because I have a thousand cases at least every year so I know, I know the way round. How can you be sure that social services don't have good reason to remove their children? I can't, I can't be sure. In the same way, you, you might as well ask a lawyer, plenty of people do, say, Why, how can you possibly defend this pedophile? Well, for a start, you can't be sure he is one. Uh, and everyone is entitled to have someone to defend them, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, you, you can't judge people. I'm not there to, to judge anyone. I'm there to help anyone who asks. Ian is part of a growing, unofficial network of people across Europe who advise parents on how to flee Britain, regardless of consequences. For a heavily pregnant woman like Mary, such a journey can be terrifying. It was very scary. I was sitting on a train, not knowing where I was going. I just I had no idea of what was going to happen when I arrived in France. With no long-term accommodation organised, she was vulnerable. I was sitting at a bus stop and I broke down in tears and that's when I picked up the phone and called Ian. Do you worry that you're undermining efforts to protect children? Well, I don't think so. I don't see how it can be undermining the efforts to protect the child when they want to give the child for adoption. By advising her to leave the country, I think she saved her child. It was Ian's contacts that eventually found her a safe house in rural France. 
From there, she was able to give birth and raise her baby. So far, my experience of French social services is the complete opposite of UK social services. Helpful, supportive. Do you like the ducks? When they came to the house, they told me that there's no reason to take him. Absolutely none. It's very upsetting knowing that you can never return to the country where you're born and where you come from. You can never see the places where you grew up or the people you grew up with. Uh, with the exception of the United States, this country has the highest proportion of children who are permanently removed from their natural family and placed for adoption against their wishes. In other words, they're opposed adoptions. So this is one of the um, bibles of social work. It's what all social workers are given to work from, from um, the government. And in it, they have a definition of emotional abuse. Um, and, and some of the things that are included under that definition is making fun of what they say or how they communicate. Um, interactions that are beyond a child's developmental capability, overprotection, limitation, exploration and learning, preventing the child from participating in normal social interaction. And, and one of the problems with, with this definition is that you can very easily find two so social workers going into the same situation and drawing very, very different conclusions. And whilst one might conclude this child is at risk of emotional harm sometime in the future, another social worker might look at the same case and, and not see evidence of that. And both social workers could find evidence to support their, their own conclusion, making them both right. I had a case where the social worker kept reciting like a little mantra in the, in the long statement she'd filed, the, mo the mother fails to put the child's needs before her own needs. And there was no example of this. And so we pressed her for an example. Can you please give us an example of the mother failing to put the child's needs before her own needs? And the judge pressed her as well because she couldn't think of an example. And she finally gave an example, which was that at the end of a contact visit, the mother put her own coat on before she put the child's coat on. Now, that's just absurd. Um, and, and she was driven to give that example because she just recited this phrase as a mantra, and it was meaningless. The Department for Education said they have carried out a review of the training for social workers and are now considering changes to ensure best practice. The government is using targets and funding to speed up adoptions and is giving less money to help families stay together. And the fear is that vague categories like future risk of emotional abuse are being increasingly used against birth families. As there's less time, less people, less resources um, to help families earlier on, um, then there is pressure to move them quickly through into adoption um, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> Heather Toomey is a mum of two who has experienced how quick the system is to presume guilt when she and her husband were accused of physically harming their son when he was a baby. Now she campaigns to help parents who have been falsely accused. It's quite straightforward from the doctor's perspective. Could this have been a non-accidental injury? If the answer is yes, which it is, in almost all these cases, they refer them on to social services, and that's the only dealing, really, they would have with the case. It then goes to social services, who then say, well, a doctor's told us it's potentially a non-accidental injury, and if you can't account for it, then your children will be removed. And the speed at which it moves that allows the parents no time to do anything other than to be a a passenger in that whole process. They can only look from outside as the wheels turn and there's no way of stopping it. In order to make the workings of the court more transparent and therefore learn lessons in child protection cases, a small number of judgments have recently been published. But the court still requests that the child and its family not be identified in order to protect the child's interests. 
In June 2013, this family were torn apart when their baby fell from a bed. The incident triggered a nine-month ordeal in which they were wrongly accused of harming their baby and were arrested. It's about time for him to start getting ready. His bedtime routine. I took him upstairs, put him on the bed, and no more than a second later, I'd turned back. He was in a mid-roll off the end of the bed, and I couldn't get to him in time. He cried, and I picked him up. It was then, then when he went into his fit, his eyes rolled back. I can just remember sitting in the front room thinking he was going to die, and that's it. Um... <laughs> yeah, so I just shut down, so... Um, and then he was kind of, like, dealing with paramedics, and I feel guilty about that now, but... Yeah, but as you said, as you said in court, that's... And as your QC said, that is your way of dealing with yeah. things. The paramedic felt the baby's injuries were not consistent with a fall from the bed and reported that the mother was emotionally withdrawn. Further medical investigations revealed injuries were in keeping with a baby being shaken. Immediately, the parents were reported to social services and three days later, they were arrested. They tried to charge us with GBH with intent. We were held in the cells for about nine hours. The only time we got out of the cells was when we were being interviewed for about an hour and a half each, and then we were back in. So, yeah, I, I, that scared me, because obviously it never had any trouble with the police, never had one, it never had a charge against me. Both parents were released on bail and no further charges were made. But three weeks after the incident, whilst their son was still seriously ill, social services were granted an interim care order. The following day, their son was taken into foster care under threat of adoption. You have to say goodbye. You have to walk away from your son while the foster care is holding your son and you go home without him. I don't know, I was lost. It's like, you know, you're... Grieved. Yeah, you, 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 you're grieving for a child that's still alive. The parents were allowed to see their baby son only three times a week under supervision. You know, I think that first session probably affected me hardest than any of the others. It's just that first time when you're holding your child and he's snuggling up to you. You know, he's resting his head on your shoulder. He's calm with you. He's happy with you. But then you have to give him back, give him to someone else. It took nine months for their son's final hearing to reach court. The parents' defence was based on an alternative medical explanation for the injuries, while social services built their case around a non-accidental injury diagnosis and the mother's behaviour and actions around the time of the incident. It was mainly, really, focused on my mental health, making me look like a monster, put me in a bad light, when really they had no evidence that I was, like, mentally ill or anything like that, you know, it was just... There was all, like I say, based it all on suspicion and hearsay, really. The judge concluded that other than the injuries themselves, there were no other features of the case which raised suspicion against the parents. He ordered that their son be given back to them. Heather campaigns because she believes in some cases social services should investigate further before a care order is sought. As a society, we often call for more action from social workers. We're often reading in the media that they fail to act. So they're under increasing pressure to, to save children from potential abuse. The problem comes when that action 
is based on such flimsy evidence, it becomes procedural abuse because we're not actually investigating anymore. We're just acting. For Heather and Darren, who were under the scrutiny of social services for two years, the pain still continues. I mean, even now, we're, we're nearly 10 years on, and it still rips your heart out. You, you'll never get over it. And for those that don't, don't get their children, it's even worse. I just can't even begin to think. The reason why we raised awareness and have continued to try and fight to raise awareness is because it could be you, it could be your brother's sister's children, it could be anybody's family. <laughs> and that's really, really terrifying. Anthony and Alison are desperate to raise their only grandson ever since social services took him away from their daughter. They looked after him every other weekend since he was born, but now he remains with foster carers. My grandson means the world to me. He's everything to me. He's like my whole life. I mean, since he's been gone, it's like I just don't know what to do with myself. We um, fed him, we changed him, we was there, every, you know, got up for him in the mornings. He's like our son. And when you know somebody from day one they're born and you have that attachment, you always will have that attachment. As soon as they realised how serious social services concerns about their grandson were, they asked to be assessed as carers. We spoke to the social services and they agreed for us to do a viability assessment, which meant that they came round to our house. Um, they went through my background and Anthony's background. We had CRV checks done. They looked at our environment. It was a very positive Outcome. assessment. Yeah. The next stage was a kinship assessment, which would take 12 weeks. Alison missed two meetings, which she tried to reschedule. She says that she was never informed by social services that this would count against her. The job that I had at the time was as a support worker, so I was working very long, unsociable hours, and I explained this to social services, and I asked if it would be possible if I could do the kinship assessment on the weekends, um, because, you know, during the week, I just really didn't have time to do it. But they said, unfortunately, that it would have to be done during office hours. I'm really cross with myself that I didn't make more of an effort to do the kinship assessment, but at the time I did not think that the situation would escalate as it did. And I also felt, because Auntie and I looked after our grandson every other weekend, that it wouldn't be possible for him, us not to be considered to, to have him. Over the next 12 months, they repeatedly tried to prove their commitment to their grandson, as questions were raised about why their own daughter had gone off the rails. I gave up my job, I paid for legal fees, um, I facilitated meetings with social services, um, and they still would not consider um, giving us an assessment. We pleaded with them and said, please give us a chance to fight for our grandson, don't just take him away. Whilst Anthony and Alison were fighting to have a kinship assessment, Social services were actively looking for adoptive parents. They prefer to parade him round at open days um, for potential adopters um, and also put him on websites. Um, and, you know, we're here. So, you know, it's really frustrating that they're trying to find a family for my grandson when he's already got a family. Well, exactly, we're here. You know, we're here for him. As loving families are being broken up, more and more children are ending up in care. There is often a failure to think through the implications of adoption as opposed, for example, to long-term fostering or to trying to find a special guardian amongst a member of the family. So certainly uh, it will be the experience of all of us that we've encountered a certain looseness of thinking there 
and an assumption that just because the child go, can't go home, therefore adoption is right. Where there are care orders, a third of those are now with a plan of adoption. So we're sort of moving these children through the care proceeding system as fast as we can in order to park them at the end, thousands of them now, with placement orders, but no placement. These children are not being adopted. A Department for Education spokesperson said, over 4,000 children were placed in stable, loving homes last year. The ultimate decision to remove a child from their families rests with the courts and should only happen when they are sure children are suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. There are concerns the government's new Children and Family Act no longer gives a clear priority to wider family over foster carers and adopters, making it more likely for a child to be placed with strangers. It's a very, very grave interference with family life and the family's legal relationship with the child is severed. So that child is legally no longer their child. Any other children they have are legally no longer that child's brothers and sisters. Anthony and Alison do not know what will happen to their grandson. Forced adoptions are closed, which means no contact until the child is 18 and only if the child wishes. If this happens, they will lose the limited contact they now have. There are nearly 4,000 children in Britain awaiting adoption, and for those who are adopted, a third will be returned to care. I know there's an order for a closed adoption, but that doesn't mean he's going to get adopted. Um, he could end up being fostered long term. You know, he could end up having several foster families throughout the next 11 years of his life. He could end up in residential care as grandparents were being punished because yeah. of the closed, closed adoption. For the moment, Alison and Anthony still have visitation rights. The minute we have to go, he heads down, he becomes this shut off little boy, you know, um, who's confused and he, he tends to want to cling near me, thinking I'm going to take him away now, take him home, and it doesn't happen, you know, so each time we see him, this is what we got to face, you know, and, um, it's so hard, man. It's so hard. I really miss him. I really do. I really, really miss him. <laughs>